Dear sisters and brothers in Christ, if you took the whole Bible and you, for some reason, needed to get rid of 99.9% of it, you could rip out all of the other pages and leave this little section that Nick just read for us from Ephesians and this little section that I just read from John's Gospel and you'd have it all. You'd have it all right there in a nutshell. In fact, as many of you know, John 3.16 that I just finished reading has often been referred to as the gospel in a nutshell. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that all who believe in him may not perish but have eternal life. All those writings, that whole book, 66 books, written over the course of a thousand years, it can all be boiled down to that one simple but profound message that God so loved the world. I might be bold enough to offer an editorial update and to say it's not past tense. It's not just that God loved the world, used to love the world, but it's that God loves the world. It's an active, not passive. It's a now, not then kind of understanding that God loves not just the human creatures, not just the Israelites or the Jewish people, not just one kind of people, not just animals, not just plants and animals. When I was a kid, you only had plants and animals. Now you've got even more. I don't, I don't know those other things that they have out there, other kingdoms. But God loves them also. God loves the whole world and made and continues to make a commitment to the world. God continues to give us God's Son as a free gift, free to us. A free gift given to us in God's grace. And so Paul, the writer of the letter to the Ephesians, reminds us that it's all about grace. That we can't earn God's favor or God's love. We can't do so many good things that they somehow outbalance the bad things that we do. It's not some kind of meter that you're kind of on the good side or the bad side of neutral. It's that God, in grace, in love, God says to you, just as you are, you are mine. And I love you enough to come into the world to bring you salvation. Do you know that the word salvation has at its root the same word as salve, like the ointment that you put on a wound? 
Think of it this way. God created the world. And remember Genesis 1 tells us, God looked at all that God had created, and behold, it was very good. And the story goes on to talk about the fall, the human fall into sin, and how we wounded God's good creation. How we estranged ourselves from God. God didn't hide from us. We, in fact, do our best to hide from God. But even back in Old Testament times, not just in New Testament times, in Old Testament times, God gave a means, a way, by which God's people could have their wounds, their self-inflicted wounds, healed. Today's first lesson about the fiery serpents is a wonderful illustration of this. The people of God, the Israelites, rebel against God and against Moses. They complain that they've been brought out of Egypt, and they're now out in the wilderness. Gianna picked up this line very nicely when she read that she says, or it, it says, there's no food here, and we detest this food. And it's speaking out of both sides of their mouth at the same time. But they're rebelling against God. And God says there are consequences. Consequences for your unfaithfulness, for your rebellion. And he sends the consequences. He sends those serpents into the Israelites' camp. And the Israelites freak out. And they say, Moses, speak to God and get God to change his mind. And as was pointed out in our lectionary study earlier uh, this morning, God does something very interesting. God doesn't take the snakes away. But God provides a means of salvation, a salve for their wounds. Look at the serpent hanging on the rod. Look at the serpent and you will be saved. You will have salvation. Jesus uses this very same imagery. But now he's talking about himself as the salve, the way of salvation. When he is lifted up, hanging on the cross, he's in a position to embrace the whole world in God's love. Not just those at the foot of the cross, not just his disciples, not just us Christians, but in Christ, in the sacrifice of Christ, God was reconciling, Paul tells us, the whole creation to God. And why? Paul tells us in Ephesians, why it is that God created us in the first place and saves us in the second place. And this is, gonna, this is going to jar some Lutheran ears. But it's for the purpose of good works. Wait, we Lutherans don't believe in good works, remember? Remember? Well, that's not true. We may have some 
misgivings about good works because Luther relying on Paul was, was very, very clear to remind us that it's not by good works that we are saved. It's not by good works that we impress God with our righteousness. And yet, good works are expected of God's people. We're expected to live our lives in a way that shows forth God's grace, that aligns our lives with what God is doing in the world. In fact, that lets our lives be used. God's work, our hands, you've heard it a million times. Let our lives be used to extend that saving grace to others so that others might receive, might see the wisdom of God which to us seems like foolishness. The wisdom of God who ordained that God, the power of the universe, would come down and get dirty with us for our salvation to become our salvation so that we can do what God expects us to do, to live in the world showing and acting, being grace to one another and to others who need desperately to hear, to feel, to experience grace and love in their lives. God created us for good. When we rebelled, God didn't shut us out, but recreated us in Christ for good, to do good. Let us, let us as the people of grace, recommit ourselves to be signs of God's grace here and now. Just like that serpent on the pole was a sign of God's salvation. Just like Jesus hanging on the cross was the ultimate sign of God's commitment to us. Let our lives, individually and corporately, let our lives be signs of God's grace, love, forgiveness. In Jesus' name, amen.